You're welcome. Thanks, Brenda. Yeah. Okay. Looks like we're recording now, so you can go on ahead. Great. All right. So hi, everyone. Like Joni mentioned, my name is Brenda Ramirez. I am the staff lead on the Free Flying Los Angeles Parrot Project at the Moore Lab of Zoology. And today I'm going to talk to you about the parrots of Southern California, which are, of course, our favorite chatty parrot neighbors. Um, and in particular, I'm talking about two specific species of parrot that have been the focus of my research during my time at the Moore Lab. And so for a little introduction on the Moore Lab, it was established in 1951 after Robert T. Moore donated his personal collection. And this collection included birds, mammals, eggs, nests, and skeletons. And so he created this collection by collecting personally and hiring people, trading, and even purchasing specimen. And so on the right, you can see we have a photo of some of the eggs from our collection. And right below, you can see we have three bird specimen with their original collection tags. And so these tags are really important. They have information on where the bird was collected, when and by who. And so they're key resources. And whenever we incorporate new birds into our collection, um, usually as salvages from window strikes or who get hit by cars, things like that, um, they get their own collection tag as well. And so Within the Moore Lab, we house around 2,200 bird species and around 65,000 individuals. And we all actually have the world's largest collection of Mexican endemic birds with around 50,000. And so this collection is an incredible resource to have. It allows us to have these kinds of windows in time of birds. And with that, we can assess a lot of different things, including how they've changed over time, both morphologically and genetically, and also we can see how their distributions have changed since we do have locality data as well. And so it's an incredible resource to be able to have um, readily available. And so I specifically work on the Free Flying Los Angeles Parrot Project at the Moore Lab. And some of our partnerships include the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, as well as SoCal Parrot, which is a parrot rescue based in San Diego that some of you may have heard of. And the main objectives of our project are to understand the ecological and genomic changes the parrots have experienced after being introduced into Southern California, and to assess how Southern California compares to their native ranges in Mexico. And so a big question that comes to mind when thinking of these objectives is how did the parrots get here? And so this is probably one of my favorite parts of my job is when I get to do public outreach and hear the stories that people have grown up with about how the parrots got here. And so if you ask anyone in Pasadena, they will tell you that in 1959, there was a pet shop fire and Allegedly, the owner was a hero and went in, released all of the animals, and that included parrots. And so you ask anyone in Pasadena and they'll let you know that's how the parrots got here. Another really popular story is the closure of Bush Gardens. People say that allegedly when they were closing the amusement park that a net in the aviary fell and that's how the parrots got released. And so one way or another, these parrots have found themselves into the wild. Um, but the biggest driver of this is the illegal pet trade. And so these birds are being smuggled from their native ranges and being brought to be sold as pets. And so they've found their way into the wild either through accidental or purposeful release. And so that brings us to the question of how many parrot species are there actually in Southern California? Since not everyone is going to own these two specific species of parrots, there's a wide variety. And so we have a project on iNaturalist, which is a community science uh, software program website um, where people can take photos of any wildlife in their neighborhoods. But because we have a project focused on parrots in Southern California, any photo that's taken gets collected into our project. And so the ones with the most observations are shown here. And so by far the most popular bird or parrot that's been seen in Southern California is the red crowned parrot, which I'm sure many of you have heard, if not seen it, um, with a lot of the other common species like the mitered parakeet, nande parakeets, the lilac crowned parrots, etc. Some of the other parrots that have been seen within the area include uh, very familiar popular pets like budgies, cockatiels, lovebirds, but we can see that there's a lot less observations of these. And then 
We have a few other species that have just a few observations around Southern California, including macaws, which I would love to see in the wild. I just have not <laughs> been able to, but some people have. And so the last group only have one observation each. And so it's very likely that these birds are escaped pets that have been photographed just once or seen a few times. But in total, just in our project alone, we have 37 species that have been recorded um, and uploaded. And so these are just the birds that have been photographed that people have uploaded to iNaturalist. There could potentially be more parrots that we haven't seen. Uh, there might be some that have just blended in because they all look so similar, lots of green and red. And so this is just a few of the species that are found in Southern California. But the main species that I focus on for my research are the most popular. So the red crown parrot, which is also Amazona viridiginalis, and its sister species, the lilac crown parrot, which is Amazona finchi. And so these parrots are native to Mexico with the red crown parrot being found in Eastern Mexico and the lilac crown parrot on the Western coast of Mexico. And so these parrots have been introduced to Southern California where they now coexist. These parrots are resident, non-migratory birds. They mainly eat seeds, fruits, flowers, and nectar, and they nest in tree cavities. Interestingly, uh, in the wild, they typically live around 20 or more years, but in captivity, they've been found to live around 50 or more. And so it's very likely that if someone got a pet parrot and didn't realize what a commitment it was, they might have let it go if they realized that they could no longer care for it or maybe had other plans and couldn't include the parrot in them. And so that's another possibility of pet release and introduction into the wild. Within their native habitat, these species are separated by two mountain ranges and a desert, as we can see by these maps. Um, and that's how we know that they don't coexist. Uh, and so on the western coast, the lilac crown parrot is typically found in tropical dry forest and coniferous forests at higher elevations, whereas the red crown parrot in eastern Mexico is found in lowland subdeciduous tropical forests. And so unfortunately, both of these species are endangered in their native ranges, but the silver lining is that they're thriving in Southern California. And so people have observed larger flocks, mainly in Los Angeles and San Diego, in very urbanized areas. They do not seem to mind busy streets or the urbanization of neighborhoods or cities. And so they will take advantage of fruit from introduced trees. Um, and typically they're found in mixed species flocks where they're forming roosts that are of a thousand or more parrots together. And so one of my favorite events that we throw every winter is called Follow the Flock, where we bring the public to the Temple City Parrot Roost. Um, for an outreach event. And so here is where thousands of parrots will gather to spend the night to roost. Um, and so it's an incredible opportunity to just see these birds come together. I feel like you hear about it like, oh yeah, like that's a lot of parrots, but to experience it is completely different. And so I have a few videos to kind of give you a little glimpse into what that's like. <laughs> And I turned it down a little bit because it gets loud, but. And so you can see the parrots are not bothered by the cars that are passing by. It's a very busy road. They only care about the trees that line the street. And so they'll gather here super close to people. There's apartment complexes, grocery stores, uh, CVS. <laughs> so they do not mind the urbanization at all. And so this brings me to the research questions that we're trying to answer about these parrots with number one being, how can we create a robust data set for these sister species in both their introduced and native ranges? Number two, how can we distinguish between both of these species since they look so similar and um, they're both here now. And number three, how do the environmental conditions of their native ranges compared to their shared introduced range? And so for our first question, the answer would be community science observations. So through iNaturalist, we've been able to create a data set where 
because all of the observations of the family satacity are collected automatically on FLAP, we have this robust data set of all the parrots and parakeets that people see in their neighborhoods. And so because of this, now we have the opportunity to gather data from across all of Southern California while involving people in science happening in their own neighborhoods. And so community science is the core of our project and it wouldn't be possible without the observations of the community. And so to show you what our project looks like, uh, this is the homepage of our project on iNaturalist. It's called FLAP because who doesn't love a bird pun? Um, but here we can see we have recent observations. Uh, we can see the different species. As we had seen already, there's around 37 and there's over 2000 observers participating in our project. And so if any of you would like to join, that would be incredible. We're always trying to get more data to make our data set even stronger. And so the way that you participate, if you haven't used iNaturalist before, is you can download the phone app. Um, so either iNaturalist or Seek would work. Seek is a little bit more user friendly where you would be able to take the picture directly from that app. Whereas iNaturalist, you would have to upload the photos. Um, so just depending on what you're more comfortable with, but it is pretty difficult to photograph a parrot in real time. <laughs> oh, and then I didn't mention the QR code in the corner is a link to our iNaturalist project. And so if you do end up joining, you would sign up for your own account and then <clears throat> you would be able to join our project by clicking the button and then trusting FLAP. Um, and so it's important to trust FLAP with your um, observations so that we can have full access to the data associated with each one. If you do not trust our project, then some of the data is obscured specifically because iNaturalist is trying to protect these endangered species um, since poachers have been known to try and get the parrots, especially when they're nesting. And so once you join our project and you do happen to see parrots in your neighborhood, you should upload your pictures. And so this is a parrot that I saw at Oxy's campus. It stopped in a tree with its flock. And so I took a few photos of it and to upload it, it's very simple. You just select it from your camera roll and it'll ask you, what did you see? And it has suggestions, which is extremely helpful if you are not sure what kind of species it is. And so you could click Amazon parrots if you're not sure specifically which kind of Amazon parrot, but it does give you more specific suggestions such as the red crown parrot, the very similar looking lilac crown parrot, or the red lord parrot. And so these all look very similar. And so if you're not sure, you can always just put Amazon parrots. But what's really great about iNaturalist is that it has the time, the date of the observation, the location. And so all of that data is very crucial for our research. And then to show you what the post looks like once your observation is uploaded, um, it'll have a map in the corner uh, with the information of the date and the time. And then you can see your identification is listed here and other iNaturalist users can then suggest their own identification. And so it's very useful. The community is very involved with helping us identify the birds. Um, and so here we're able to confirm species identification. And if two identifications agree, it's considered a research grade. And so it's very likely that that observation identification is correct. And so this is how we collect all of our geotemporal data um, for our research. And so now that brings us to the question of how can we distinguish between these two parrots? They look extremely similar. Even iNaturalist gives you multiple suggestions for what they could be. And so the answer to that is to look for key features. It's a little difficult if you can't get a close enough look, but the key things you would wanna look for are iris color, the bare skin, so the skin around the eye or the orbital, and the skin above the beak or the sear, the forecrown color, and the, if they're scalloping on the breast feathers. And so we'd look for darker coloration on the edges of the feathers of the breast. And so for the lilac crown parrot, we can zoom in on its facial features and start by looking at the iris. We can see that lilac crown parrots have a darker red or orange iris. They have that darker skin around their eye and that darker skin above their beaks. And of course, that maroon forecrown. We can also see that the red does not go as far back as with the red crown parrots. For the red crown parrots, if we zoom in, we can see they have more of a yellow lighter iris. They have a white orbital 
and more of a cream colored skin above their beak, as well as that bright cherry red forecrown that does extend further back. And so, although it's difficult to see from further away, if you get that closer look, it does get a little bit easier. And a fun way that I like to tell people that you can tell them apart is that the lilac crown parrot looks like it has a smoky eye makeup look, and so it looks like they're ready to hit the town. But in general, the lilac crown parrot does have darker features compared to the red crown parrot. And so in order to compare the environmental conditions of their native ranges to their introduced range, we have to gather information on their native range. And so if you've noticed, I've only been talking about the introduced range um, since iNaturalist is collecting observations from Southern California. And so for the native ranges, we can use eBird uh, to get both of those observations from Mexico. And so the biggest differences between eBird and iNaturalist is that eBird tends to collect more data for the different observations. It's more semi-structured community science where they collect data on the date and time, the location, how long someone went birding, how far they went, if they recorded all of the birds that they saw and heard. So that would be a complete checklist. And it's not necessary to upload photos, but you can if you want. Whereas iNaturalist is a little bit more unstructured where they only collect data on the date and time, the location, and you do need to have the photos. And so it's important to be able to have consistent data throughout both of our data sets. And so it's important to filter it and process all of it so that we have the most unbiased data set possible. And for that, in Mexico, since the species don't coexist, it was very unlikely for there to be any misidentifications. And so we were a little bit less worried about having to check through each of the observations or making sure that the species didn't interact where we wouldn't expect them to. Uh, for that, we removed observations outside of their native ranges in case any of them did kind of creep out. Um, and we also followed the established best practices to remove any biases associated with community science data. And so for our final data set, within our introduced range, we had 517 red crown parrots, 372 lilac crown parrots, and in the native range, we had 748 red crown parrots and 5,786 lilac crown parrots. In order to understand how their environmental conditions differ in all of these regions, we included different environmental uh, predictors. So bioclim is a very popular one used for a lot of these uh, geospatial analyses. So this includes information on 19 temperature and precipitation variables. So for example, you can look at how annual precipitation differs from each of the regions, how precipitation seasonality, um, you could do annual rainfall, um, the hottest quarter of the year, different environmental conditions like that. We also looked at Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, or NDVI, which is basically a measure of vegetation greenness. And if we take the standard deviation of that, that shows us the greenness seasonality, so how the greenness changes throughout the year. We also looked at percent tree cover and the level of urbanization as well as elevation. And so elevation was included uh, because the lilac crown parrots did prefer the higher elevations in their native ranges. And so we wanted to see how that compared to both the red crown parrot range and in Southern California. And so in order to have a good estimation of what the environmental conditions are like in all of these areas, we created buffers um, so that we could get readings on the environmental conditions surrounding the parrot locality. And so we want to know the overall differences in their environmental conditions or their niches um, between all of these regions. And so having that full picture makes it easier to compare all of these areas. And so to kind of put it into perspective, um, the easiest way to think about all of these environmental conditions and all of these buffers and localities is think of it as all of our environmental predictors are layers in a stack. And then each location of the parrot is a pin that we drop right on that coordinate. And from that, we can pull all of the environmental conditions from that point, as well as the surrounding area within that buffer. But those are the main things that we're comparing. 
um, within both ranges for both species. And so to compare our different Amazona niches, it's gonna get a little bit technical, but I'm gonna walk through it uh, step by step. Uh, the first analysis we did was a principal component analysis, which essentially is used to assess the variation within our data. And so it makes it into two dimensions where similar observations are grouped together and the axes show the variables that vary the most between the groups. We also used univariate box plots where we assess the differences between the environmental conditions. The main spread of the common conditions are shown by the colored boxes and the less common conditions are represented by the gray circles. So here we can see species one and species two being compared for one variable. And then finally, we use reciprocal species distribution models. And so these are used to estimate habitat suitability in the introduced range based on the environmental conditions in the native ranges. So essentially we see how suitable Mexico is and then we project that to Southern California. And so the way that we read these maps is the warmer colors represent high su suitability and the cooler colors represent low suitability. So that's just a little preview onto the suitability of Southern California for these parrots. So to begin with our principal component analysis on the left, we have the purple circle that is a solid line representing the actual conditions where the lilac crown parrots were found and the red crown parrots shown in the red solid circle. And so here we can see that these circles are not overlapping. And so we know that based on our axes that temperature, greenness, precipitation, and tree cover explained most of the variation within our data. And so that's how we know that temperature, greenness, precipitation, and tree cover are not very similar within their native ranges as shown on this map in Mexico. Whereas if we looked at the dotted lines to represent the introduced range, we can see that the red dotted and the purple dotted lines, which represent the introduced red crowned and lilac crowned parrot um, observations, they completely overlap, which we expect since they're both found in Southern California. Um, and the green dotted line represents the buffered background. So that's our E space. And so here we can see that the two species have divergent and non-overlapping environmental niches in their native ranges and that they don't overlap with the introduced ranges as well. And so if we add another layer to this, which would be the environmental conditions surrounding the lilac crown parrots in the darker purple and the environmental conditions surrounding the red crown parrots in the darker red, now we can see there's just a little bit of overlap where it wouldn't be impossible for these parrots to be able to establish in Southern California. We can see that they do fit into that bigger environmental gradient that's encompassed within our buffer. And so even though they specific, the environmental conditions at their specific localities do not match the introduced range, their general overall niche does. And so although the niches of the introduced populations overlap, they are divergent from both of the native niches and they occupy a much smaller portion of the environmental space. And so to get kind of a closer view of the environmental divergence between these species and between their ranges, now we can look at the box plots uh, that explain the most variance within our data set. And so we can look at temperature, greenness, precipitation, and tree cover. And so on the left, we have annual mean temperature. We have the native range for the red crown parrot and the lilac crown parrot on the left. And we have the introduced range of the red crown parrot and the lilac crown parrot on the right. And so here we can see that the annual mean temperature um, in the introduced range is almost entirely non-overlapping with that of the native range. And so we can see um, that they do have that different environmental condition within um, the introduced range based on annual mean temperature. Uh, similarly, for vegetation greenness, we can see that the native ranges experience higher vegetation greenness, whereas the introduced range has a little bit lower, uh, and there isn't as much overlap within these main boxed regions that are colored. If we look at precipitation seasonality, we can see that there's a little bit more overlap, 
and that the lilac crown parrots in their native ranges typically do experience uh, more levels of rainfall um, than the red crown parrots, uh, but it's not as drastically different to the introduced range. And then for elevation, we can see that the lilac crown parrots are commonly more uh, likely to be found at higher elevations in their native ranges, whereas the introduced parrots, there did not seem to be a difference uh, between the species on where they were found. And so it seems as though they're not taking advantage of the surrounding mountains in the area and have tended to stay within these urbanized areas. For our reciprocal species distribution models, starting with the red crown parrots, on the left, we have a zoomed in photo of Eastern Mexico. Um, and so for this map, we can see the habitat suitability. The warmer colors represent where the parrots are found. But of course, we have that buffer to capture that environmental um, surrounding area. And so if we take this habitat suitability and project it to Southern California, we can see that there's very little suitable habitat. It would be in the lower, cooler colors, um, but the little habitat that we do see is found in the regions of Southern California where we have those larger flocks of parrots. And so, again, we can see that it's not impossible for these parrots to um, survive and thrive here. Um, it just seemed like it would be very, very unlikely. If we look at the suitability for the lilac crown parrot in their native ranges, again, we can see we have their distribution in Western Mexico with their environmental buffer um, included. If we project that to Southern California, we can see even less suitable habitat. There's just this small pocket in the LA region where there's a tiny bit of suitable habitat um, and it's not very suitable at all. And so again, it doesn't seem as though these parrots would be able to establish in these populations. And so that brings us to the question of why? What has made them so successful in Southern California? And so a big thing would definitely be food availability. There's tons of fruits, flowers, exotic trees. I've seen many pictures of parrots just enjoying a lot of fruit. Uh, people in Southern California have a lot of exotic fruit trees. And so they've definitely taken advantage of that. I also think it's important to note that a lot of the native species in the area don't take advantage of the same resources. And so after their introduction, they had this open uh, food source that they have been able to take advantage of. Another possibility is the propagule pressure, uh, which essentially is there have been multiple releases of these parrots over this wide time span. And so having multiple introductions has probably made it easier for these populations to establish and thrive. Um, another possibility would be ecological release. And so that's essentially when a species is introduced into another area and the predators and competitors are removed. And so there isn't as much pressure um, on them. And so they can build up their populations and thrive. And so another uh, key thing is that there's human made and natural cavity nests available. As far as we know, the parrots aren't invasive. They're only non-native, and so they're not harming the environment in any way. And so they take advantage of any empty cavity nests that they find, um, and they're able to use those for their own breeding. And so the main conclusions of our research so far is that community science is a key tool for understanding these parrots. They have very different environmental niches, and there's there are significant differences in their native ranges um, for both parrot species, but a convergence into a novel shared environmental niche in Southern California can be characterized by cooler temperatures, less tree cover, and lower rainfall. And so now there's a new opportunity for hybridization as well. And so now that these parrots coexist, we want to understand how that affects their environment. So. How can we distinguish hybrids, again, by looking at their features? And so a hybrid will typically have lighter orange or a yellow iris. Uh, sometimes they'll have the white orbital or the darker. Same thing with the skin or the skin above the beak. Sometimes they'll be darker or lighter. Um, and then oftentimes they'll have 
uh, the cherry red foreground with the darker gray, it's all just a mix. And so seeing hybrids in these iNaturalist observations has been very interesting. From that, we've been able to understand that hybridization is happening. We don't know to what extent, um, but it is a clue as to how these species are interacting with one another now that they coexist. And so for future directions, we want to understand how hybridization rates and dynamics um, are being affected now that these parrots coexist. Uh, we wanna know if there's any reproduction barriers between the two species to see if the hybrids would continue to reproduce or if they wouldn't be able to. We would wanna understand what has allowed the red crowned parrots to establish in other places in the United States since there are populations in Texas, Florida, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and how different are these places to one another as well as to their native ranges. Um, we would also be interested to study the other non-native parrots. Do they similarly take advantage of uh, the resources that the Amazona parrots have, or is there any competition between different species? Um, and then we would also next are actually going to compare the genetics of older museum specimen with present day samples to understand how the parrots have evolved over time. And so that's what we're actively working on now that we've finished um, the environmental analysis. And so using uh, DNA from museum specimen as well as DNA from parrots um, that were from SoCal Parrot, the parrot rescue, now we can compare how these species have been interacting over their time span here. And so with that, is there any questions? Thank you so much for listening. Uh, again, if you'd like to join our iNaturalist project, there's a QR code there. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. And I think we have some messages in the chat. Oh, would you like to hear the video again? Sure. I, I yeah, it was it was very faint for us. It was, sounded like it was real loud for you. It was very loud. So I turned it down thinking it would be blasting for you, but that's okay. <laughs> I can replay. Yeah, we aren't really hearing it. We heard somebody talking, but we're not hearing the parrots. What about this one? No. No. I know sometimes it's kind of tricky getting the audio to work on the videos. Okay. Well, it's very loud. <laughs> I can we'll promise. Trust, we'll that. trust you. It's very loud. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there was one question about um, eBird. I know a lot of people here use eBird, and you did mention that for the native range, you do um, get that information. But is there any way that you can somehow pull the um, observations from Southern California that were entered in eBird that have photos, or do, do those people still need to put them in iNaturalist? No, we can pull those observations from eBird. It is possible. Uh, we just haven't so far. I feel like iNaturalist is a little bit easier since it does collect all of the observations automatically, um, specifically for Southern California. I feel like as though eBird, we would have to do a little bit more filtering um, and look through specific observations since a lot of the checklists don't include those photos. Um, but it is definitely possible. And I feel like eventually we could incorporate that into our data set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know like for myself, when I heard about this project, it was kind of just a fun project for me where I went into my eBird and I looked for all the parrot species that I had recorded there and I was easily able to then upload them into iNaturalist. I had the date and the time and the location and the photo, so it was pretty easy to do it and it was kind of fun reliving all those moments too, so... We did yeah. have another question about, um, so you had mentioned that the parrots do tend to eat a lot of the non-native plantings, like mm -hmm. seeds and, and fruits and things. And is there um, any kind of concern that they're spreading these non-native plants? Uh, I mean, not that I know of. I feel as though 
because we're in such urbanized areas, if they do happen to eat like a loquat seed and they spread the seed to a different part of LA, I don't think it's very likely for these trees to grow on their own. I think they'd have to be tended to. And so I don't believe that it's an immediate concern um, as to the spread of non-native plants throughout Southern California, but that's a good thought for sure. I'm looking through the chat. I don't see any other questions. I don't know if um, anybody wants to just go ahead and, and uh, raise a question. Maybe you already mentioned this, but what are the the most significant environmental stressors? Like, what can we do as citizens uh, to, um, you know, the better, you know, the better be better, be better stewards of parrots and to improve their uh, quality of life? Yeah, I appreciate that question a lot. Um, I feel as though the parrots have been very independent with their success. We have done very little to help make these populations as big as they are. They've been very good at finding the resources themselves. Um, so I think keeping them in your mind as you go birding, making sure to record these observations, definitely contributing to our project. Um, but the biggest thing is I know that there's poachers that have been seen in some areas of Southern California report them, don't interact with them by any means, but, you know, report them to the authorities since it is illegal to set up nets to capture birds in that way. And so I think that's kind of the biggest thing, but we definitely don't need to plant any more exotic trees or anything like that. I feel like we want to keep native plants as a priority, um, but I think just keeping an eye out for, for them in general, especially in your neighborhood so that we can have more information on what conditions they're preferring and exactly what is helping them thrive here. What can I do to attract um, to attract parrots? Because I often see them fly overhead and, you know, I, I wish they were closer to me, actually. I do, too. That's a really tricky question. I know someone asked about uh, making a feeding station for parrots, which sounds like an incredible idea, but it might attract other pests. So, for example, I know parrots really like loquats and pears and all kinds of trees and sea or fruit trees um, and nuts. And so this will also attract other pests like rats or even coyotes or rodents. And so that's a really tricky question. I feel like there isn't the perfect way to go about it. I feel like there would be other unwanted guests <laughs> in your area. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we got another Is question. Any... Um, do you know what species colonize Telegraph Hill in San Francisco? Ooh, I don't off the top of my head. I believe they might be red crowned, if not mitered parakeets. Hmm. But I would have to double check that. Is and... there any evidence that they might be utilizing space? that otherwise would be used by native species of birds? Not that we've seen. I feel as though the red crown parrots have found the perfect little pocket within Southern California. Um, I have heard there is some disagreeance with the acorn woodpeckers and I believe the Nande parakeets with their nesting cavities, but that's the only instance that we've heard of where there might be any conflict between uh, different species with the parrots. But so far within the city, there hasn't been any conflict. I mean, besides like pair or um, hawks trying to go after young, things like that, just normal expected interactions. You also write at the very end, you mentioned at least a half dozen places, other places where these birds have taken up residence. Doesn't that suggest that they're <clears throat> they're just mighty adaptable? Oh, absolutely. That's definitely one of the biggest possibilities where they have a bigger overall niche and that in their native ranges, they just didn't have the opportunity to explore those kinds of areas. And so even though they could, they just didn't have the opportunity. And so that's definitely a possibility. And we have another question in the chat. Is there any possibility of using the Southern California parrots to help repopulate the endangered native Mexico populations? 
That is a great question. Um, there aren't any talks of it now, but eventually there could be a rescue population that's taken from the Los Angeles. But that's a great reason as to why the genomic research has to happen first. It wouldn't be good if we introduced a hybrid or that might not even have visible features as a hybrid, but that has that mixed genetic um, DNA. And so we would wanna make sure that any species that get taken to Mexico are in fact the correct ones. Um, but it is a possibility, we just don't know yet. Mm -hmm. And um, is it possible that some of these parrots that we find locally may have actually found their way here naturally? And, and also, do you think climate change may have impacted their distribution in some way? Um, in Southern California, there has not been any suggestion that they were brought or that they came here naturally since these are non-migratory birds. In Texas, however, because um, Southern Texas is so close to the native red crown parrot range, Many people do say that they are natural populations. Uh, we would have to do, I think, genetic research specifically on those groups, though, to be able to fully say. Uh, but for Southern California and the other states, they're definitely not naturally occurring or have not migrated there naturally. Um, and climate change, as far as we know, uh, the biggest factors affecting their population sizes in their native ranges would be habitat destruction and the poaching. And so I'm sure climate change is not helping. Um, but as of now, the main things that are really decreasing their populations are the um, urbanization of their native ranges. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Does anyone else have a question they'd like to ask? Well, I do want to say, I know that the Moore Lab is a little bit far from San Diego, but if you ever find yourself in Eagle Rock, uh, we do have public collection tours. Like I mentioned, we have outreach events uh, like Follow the Flock, which I definitely recommend, especially since the video was so quiet over the Zoom call. Um, it's life changing to see that many parrots. It's so unexpected. And, you know, I'm sure you've seen the large flocks flying over uh, during the day, but when thousands come in to roost for the night, it's incredible, especially because of how close they get. And so if you ever have the opportunity to visit a roost, I definitely recommend it. I know that the San Diego Bird Festival has had a, a parrot watch that they'll go out real early in the morning or later for the afternoon roost. And um, I did go on one of those and saw, I mean, it's nothing like your video, but maybe, I don't know, maybe a hundred. Um, and it, so and it was, that was pretty noisy. And it was right by this big apartment complex where there's all these trees planted. And all I could think is, I, I hope all those people really love parrots because it's really <laughs> noisy. <laughs> yeah, no, similarly in Temple City, there's apartment complexes, stores, people everywhere. They don't seem to mind. <laughs> Great. Well, it looks like we're done with our questions. So thank you so much for, for uh, sharing with us this information. It's been really great. And we learned a lot. And I hope that some of you will go into iNaturalist and post some of your pictures so that we can help Brenda um, add to her uh, information. Thank you so much for listening. All right, great. Thanks, everybody. And we hope to see you next month at the Nature Center. Bye-bye. Have a good night.